And with that, I will hand things over to Tara um, to introduce herself as well as today's MSP partners. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everybody. I would just like to know before we uh, get started here that we have about 25 or sorry, 50 years of experience between all of us. So you guys are in for a real treat here. Uh, we've been in the IT field for a long time and it's something that we like to talk about. So on that note, this is a little bit about me, but I know you're not really here to talk to, talk to me or hear from me. So I'm gonna introduce our panel here. So our guests are here with us today and we have Matt Lee, who is really focused on technology and security at Iconic IT. He's leading the way as a pathfinder there. And then we also have Robinson Roca, who is a practice leader and has a very extensive background on a breadth of different networking technologies and pieces of hardware. So on that note, I would like to welcome you two to our, um, to our event today. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to skip. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just coming off mute. Oh, okay. That was just me, me coming off. Okay. Hi, I'm going to start with question one. Good morning, and here we go. What are some of your biggest pain points that you've had to work through as you've grown as MSPs? Boy, where do you start on that? I, I guess, you know, from our story, I started when it was seven of us. Uh, we were break fix and started going down that, uh, you know, uh, down that path of becoming a managed service provider. But, you know, the biggest things I would say is just the iteration of change and how many times you have to have a different paradigm and a different paradigm shift that, that you have to adjust for, right? A pivot um, in the sense of think of simple things like when it's seven of you and you have a handful of 20 or 30 clients, you have some degree of an organic transfer of information, right? That people can communicate. Rocco knows what I'm doing. And I know what he's doing. And we have some correlation and it, and it feels very intimate to the client. But as you start getting larger, you start having some gaps in that intimacy potentially. And you may have to uh, have forced communications or, or strategic methods to get communication across. And and I guess, you know, that's just one little small example, but it goes really, really far. And it goes into trying to continuously assess the customer's experience, continuously change things to to pivot and, and be able to account for those differences in your organization and theirs. Um, and so I, I'd say that the biggest piece is have some method to change, have some method to pivot. Uh, would be my my Matt Lee succinct answer, which I'm not exactly known for. So, Rocco, I'm sure you, know, you have. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting for me? It's a uh, it's it's very similar, but I I ran very early into. So I've worked for MSPs for quite a while. Um, I actually I I really enjoy working in that space. You work with so many different people and personalities, uh, different verticals. It's awesome. But um, one of the key uh, issues that I've always had, especially in the networking field, is there are customers that have um, onboard usernames and passwords. So you've got these username and passwords that are on your switches, your routers, your firewalls, and many firms, smaller firms, don't kind of centralize that authentication. Um, so one of the, the hurdles I've always had uh, managing and leading uh, the networking team and MSPs is... Uh, trying to have that buffer, that isolation between my internal staff and the customer's equipment, you know, it, staff changes over time. And, you know, as they leave, I don't want them to leave with my customer's passwords. Um, so, you know, when I started bringing Ovik in, I saw out of the box, I had that kind of ability to isolate customers from the gear. I can give them an Ovik password. And at that point, keep all of my customers' passwords within Avic. They click on that piece of equipment and it they're right in and based on the role that I provided them. So I honestly, that's one of the, the biggest hurdles that I really wanted to get over and using some of the other tools I had before Avic really didn't give me that. And, uh, you know, it's all rolled into one here in this tool. So it, it's that's one of the hurdles I really, really happy to get past. <laughs> I love it. Um, building on that, uh, Robson, one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, for some of us who have been in the IT space for decades, um, you know, there, there was there was, you know, the bare metal, the, you know, manual processes, the I know it's done right because a human being did it. And as we see more and more automation, is there anything that you try to kind of build into those practices and processes as you're maturing as an organization? I know this is something that Matt's uh, kind of dealing with on his side of things, but maybe Robinson, you could start us off to what you've seen. And then Matt, you can kind of complement that. 
Yeah, you know, uh, again, uh, leaning back onto the network infrastructure side of things, you know, like you said, you know, we've been through this, <laughs> been doing this for a very long time. Um, you know, it, it's this new cloud as a service infrastructure comes with this this environment where configurations and and the builds are all in the cloud, and you don't have to worry about it. But back in the day, like two years ago, we had um, we we had static network configurations on routers and firewalls that stayed there. And if the piece of equipment died, right, now you're struggling to, to look for old copies, old backups, things like that. Um, so for me, the, the big difference, the big change is the ability of controlling that configuration backup, ensuring that you always have an up-to-date copy. So when that piece of equipment dies, I can feel very rest assured that I've got my configuration ready to go. It's yeah. that's my favorite piece. I, I I'll second that, Rob. I mean, absolutely. With the the understanding of you, you hit the nail on the head. We're driving towards this homogenous platform, desired state configuration, where things are 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 somewhat ubiquitously cloud driven, and everything's tied together, decentralized identities. Like we're seeing that shift. But let's not forget, we have infrastructure, right? We have all of these things that have been part of that blocking and tackling, right? Like you said, backing up a config and having control of that. So if that thing dies, I can put it back in place and we can get back to function, right? And, and I think you hit the nail on the head is that we still cannot abscond from our due care around the network side, around the tactical operational pieces of the normal management of day to day. People are having less servers. People are getting rid of those things. Like I understand that's happening, but they still have application loads. Those might be here for 10 years, right? There's EMRs that we won't see around for literally ever, right? And so I think that, you know, today, just as much as ever, having that ability through through Avic, which is great, to just restore, right? You just pull the text config and go slap it on the next switch, right? I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're ready to go. You, you, you look professional. You have some of those, you know, uh, components of compliance that say, I have a network map. I know where my edges are. I can see those things on on, the, on that. So I mean, there's there's tons of pieces that go into it, and you know, cybersecurity doesn't go away either. And all of those are components of maintaining some visibility of what we own, how we manage it, what its configuration state is, what its baseline state is, obfuscation of passwords, as you said, you know, Rob, perfectly right that you can have personnel come and go, and it's really just this role based access, not some degree of do they remember the password, like. You know, I, I'm getting up on my soapbox here, and you know I can get going, but uh, I, would, I really nailed that one, that, that we can't forget our infrastructural core. And I'm a big believer in platform. I like to live three years out, right? But I often forget today. <laughs> so yeah. good reminder and, and call back to, to that reality as well. So, Yeah, yeah. Well, and on that note, you know, you talked, you, you touched on this a little bit, but in terms of integrations, you know, wanting to make sure that you, you've got that full visibility into your core infrastructure, you know, how, how do you guys tend to manage some of those core integration pieces and those, those tagging what's critical and then making that happen? I, I mean, if you don't mind me, I, I could talk yeah. about that all day. I am so... <laughs> I, I am so all about integration. In today's MSPs, you can't think of the older MSPs that have been around for years and years and years that are still using the archaic managing and monitoring platform. Integration is key these days. So being able to take a tool and, and integrating it into your existing other platforms. So for example, um, I have always made it a point that when I start to work at a new MSP, uh, and if I'm leading or directing, depending on whatever my role is at that particular point, is to take all my tools and combine them behind a single pane of glass if possible, right? So I've got today uh, here at Helium, I've got Ovic uh, and uh, several other monitoring tools, but at, in front of that, I've got my PSA. So my customers are getting tickets directly from my PSA that are tied into Ovic, tied into my other tools. And it's very rich ticket. In that ticket, I've got a link that takes them directly into the piece of equipment that is problematic. But on top of that, I've got all this extra rich data that is being captured. You know, I've got uh, uh, support contracts that are being expired or, or expiring. I've got that data. I've got, you know, hardware that's going end of life. I've got that data. I've, I go up against, you know, at least uh, yearly, I go up against other MSPs that are vying for my business, and <laughs> I stand out because they're coming with four or five different applications. Here, customer, and I'm giving them this one page 
that has ABC data behind it. And uh, it, it, it really makes us stand out. It's key. And if, you can, and if you can display that data in some heads up means that they can consume it and, and see it and understand it. Yeah. I mean, and think about it, what you just said there for an MSP, you just said, I have hunting ground for hardware sales, right? Like I, I literally can tell someone to just go find expired stuff and call clients and help them understand their risks. Right. Like, I mean, you know, unpacking all that, there's tons in there that, you know, you, you really kind of nailed down that go back towards that building your business and growth perspective as well. But, you know, having a rich ticket that, that has data that you can action upon, right? Especially if it sounds like maybe more in a co-managed model versus, you know, your actual technicians. But either way, it's giving that enriched information of here's what's out, here's why it's down, here's what it's affecting, right? Having ticket information about that and, and some history tied to it, maybe documentation pulled in as well. You know, you're right. A single pane of glass is so important um, to make efficiencies go up, right? Uh, yeah. To give people presence and, and state of what they're looking at and uh, so they can have some situational awareness. And yeah, I mean, it, absolutely. You're, I think the way you use your tools in that way uh, speak towards being able to deliver real rich context information. So um, yeah, there's, there's one other piece, if you don't mind me jumping in and adding another piece. You know, before I, before I even thought of like an AVIC type tool, there were, you know, I'm not going to say names, but there are these other tools out there that have been around for a while that a lot of people use. Um, and I tried to bring that into my MSP space. And what was required was I needed to install one instance of that tool in my data center. And then I had to install another smaller instance of that tool at every MSP. And then I had to have connectivity between those clients back to my data center for reporting services. And all of, and none of that was tied into anything else. I had to capture all that data separately into a spreadsheet, export it. This is a different world we live in. And this integration, if you don't have, if you don't integrate, you're going to die. And, uh, you know, uh, this is one of the key fe features that I'm, I've been, you know, champion championing for um, in the management and monitoring space. I know you have, and, and kind of to that point, you know, can we can we kind of build on that and say, okay, look at so streamlining our operations, getting those integrations done. Really, what we're talking about is having better time to identify issues and resolve issues. So, having said that, I know you guys have had some really great stories over the years. Um, has there been anything that really kind of sticks out in your mind in terms of Avic uh, helping you with something? Oh, it sounds like Matt's got something, but Avic uh, helping you with something that maybe you weren't expecting or really cutting down some of that time. I will. I'll go to one that was not as as expectedly technical. Um, I had a client of mine that was kind of a co-managed situation, you know, like you speak of here, um, and he was the IT director of a um, uh, farm implement large distributor. Let's call it. Um, and and he was actually a paraplegic. Right, he had fallen off a ladder hanging an access point, uh, and had become a paraplegic at a former position. And talk about grace uh, that that human being has. He's one of my my best friends now uh, as time has passed over the last eight or nine years. But, you know, when we first started using Avic, what had happened was they have this very complex network. And, and this gentleman has the ability to kind of stand up in his wheelchair where it'll kind of put him up enough that he could get up to the front of a rack. Um, but he doesn't have the ability to go trace wires back behind a rack, right? He's not going to be able to maneuver in that position. And so we were trying to figure out something and they were a two hour drive and, and I was ready to drive out and help them figure this out. And I said, you know, let's use this tool we installed at that time. This was many, many moons ago. Let's use that tool we installed and see if I can figure something out. And we were able to determine the end user's machine they were looking for to move into a different switch stack for a different VLAN that they wanted to access for some things in that office. Um, they they were, were going to be able to find that wire and he was able to remove it himself, right? He didn't have to call for someone to help him. I didn't have to drive the two hours to go help him find this out. He's able to remove it himself. And so it was just this moment where, um, you know, those, those other pieces of, you know, capability really changed his world you know, in, a, in an interesting way. Um, but it was really meaningful to me to have that kind of information that, you know, prior to that, trying to figure out what Mac address was the end of the device, you're going to go pull tables, you're going to go manually do it yourself and try to figure it out. And this was one of those things where it was easy for him just to go, oh, it's right there. I can get this. And, and right. I mean, it's just that, yeah, it was wonderful. So, uh, you know, that was my kind of unexpected moment on that. And um, th that one stands out for me is a long time ago, but it, it definitely does. So. Yeah. I I uh, I've got a I've got a good one. It's um if you don't mind me adding it now, I'm not yeah. pressed for time, right? Because oh, no, I have a tendency I have a tendency to talk too much. Um, so there's been this uh, 
I had a client recently. I mean, this is at least a month ago. Um, and this customer had, uh, they're growing, you know, they just added a one gig pipe to their internet, you know, service. And, um, they, they were saturating that one gig pipe. They didn't mean it. They didn't know what was going on. Um, they just knew that there was a lot of traffic going out that one gig pipe. Um, they were running one of those older tools that's been around for a long, long time. And they could see that they were saturating it. They just couldn't identify from where. And uh, they have a person on prem, and they were doing all the the old, age old ARP address information and tying it to MAC address, and he just couldn't find it. Couldn't figure out where it was going. Um, so they called us, you know, because we we supported them on the server side, but since they had a network engineer, they didn't really find us useful at that point. Um, but they called us to see if we can help. In first thing I did, my go to drop in Ovic. It's quick easy you know i throw up an instance and i'm ready to go um i throw it in i start you know pulling in data not only did i find you know the source of the traffic i could trace it all the way back to the fact that it was a wireless user coming in on a specific access point and they were saturating a one gig pipe because they were using 802.11 ax uh, ap's so they were saturating the internet pipe from a no. wireless user and <laughs> I, since I had traffic insights running, because I wanted to really impress them, um, <laughs> uh, I, I was able to not only identify the user, I was able to identify the source, the destination, the ports, uh, and what the traffic actually was. Um, and they were doing a, you know, they were doing a, a, a Dropbox copy from a wireless machine, um, but they, they weren't able to determine it. And I was able to show them screenshot. Here you go. Look. Dropbox, not just on destination, but yeah. on the actual protocol. So that in itself is a, a shining moment that I really, I really found the most use. At the end of the day, that old tool is out. And uh, you, you, know what? you remind me of another awesome story from a long time ago as well. <laughs> I told this one client that every day at nine thirty, the network problems would resolve, but from eight to nine thirty, it was brutal, right? Mm -hmm. It's 9.30, network problem resolved, and they, they're trying to figure it out personnel. They finally identify that somebody kind of comes in at that point. But what it turned out was it was a NIC that was dying, and when the machine was off, it was sending a broadcast storm. And this was this was a long time ago, but it was sending this just giant flood of broadcast storm. Um, and, so, and so this was uh, one of those where when she'd turn on her machine and the operating system would take over rather than EFI drivers, then the, the NIC would heal itself. It was fine. It was okay when the OS was running. Wow. But it was a situation. Yes, yeah, Steve, you were involved. Yep, you were others involved. <laughs> and so we're trying to find it. And we just have these broadcast packets going into the millions before, you know, before at 9 a.m. And we turned it into Sally's machine and replaced the machine and it was fine. Um, but, yeah, it was one of those really re weird ones. And it, it was something that had plagued us. And this was early. I mean, this would have been, I mean, early for me relatively to, to you guys' tenure, but certainly in the 2011, 2012 range, right, when – these type of tools were exactly as you said, kind of the maybe it was a little later, but somewhere in that time frame. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting one. That one really saved the day. Well, and what I like about those instances is it really helps you identify the business value of these things, right? So in the case where it's like, okay, somebody's using Dropbox to move, you know, business content, you know, proprietary content. Are you aware of that? You know, is this is this a sanctioned process? Is this what's going on? So, you know, is this intended to be what's going on? So I love that it also helps them kind of determine, hey, this is IT stuff that can actually focus information elsewhere to let you know you might have a problem on another side of the house, right? That's not even IT based, right? Yeah. 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 We got so, a question from Adam here. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. So I get asked this. I'm on calls all day long with MSPs. And this question has come up a couple of times. Go figure. So just for the, the audience, how are we bundle how are we bundling Ovic into our MSP packages? Are you adding a certain amount to each user device? Do you have some other way of covering the cost for some basic fees? Um, Robinson, why don't you take off with this first? Then sure. Matt, and then I will offer something if you guys uh, if there's still some space there. Sure. Um, from my perspective, Helium started um, managing and maintaining network infrastructure about we're going on two years now um, so we were really just managing and maintaining and and building out vdi infrastructure and you know a lot of the user facing front end infrastructure so just desktops servers things along those lines so when i came in 
one of the key pieces that I needed was immediate visibility, getting in and monitoring off the bat. And it had to be a clean and quick, easy tool to deploy. So uh, when we started packaging network infrastructure into our contracts, that became a um, almost an add-on feature for us. So, um, it, and it's grown since then. It's, na it's now become a mandatory piece of our contract. If you want us to give you a, uh, a, the best user experience, then we need to also see not only the desktop, but all the way through to your network infrastructure. So uh, we bundled it into our, our managed services contracts. So if you are getting a, a contract from Helion and we are managing and monitoring your infrastructure, Alvic is a piece of that contract. And yes, we do keep track of the number of devices that are being collected on that client's end, and we are uh, appropriately charging for those devices. Yeah, and we've um, we've ebbed and flowed through different stages of how we deploy it um, in my different you know tenure. So when we started at Choose Networks, which was an MSP in Wichita, Kansas, before our merger to become Iconic IT, um, we had been putting it in everything. I mean, it was in every contract. It was very similar to the way you said, Rob, is that we kept track of it and we kind of looked at it and said, you know, does this cost make sense, right? Um, you know, and it's one of those products that I think it's great. It does all these things that have not a whole lot of tangible value right now until they really do. I can't tell you how many times somebody didn't have the firewall backup saved where they were supposed to. And I was able to pull that firewall backup out of off it, right? I mean, there's a little bit of work to do and stuff, but yeah, absolutely. But I would say that, you know, now what we've started doing is letting each individual org decide per per org how much they're going to deploy and where and using it very strategically, right? And so then they just keep account of the cost. We don't want to have the client have to choose yes, no, right? And so we want to be able to use it where we need it. So everyone's empowered in my organization to deploy this where it makes sense and where they need it. And so some of our higher value clients, some of our higher network complexity clients, some of our things that you know, if you've got a switch and a firewall, still great to have a firewall backup, still great to have a switch. But boy, it's a requisite when you've got dynamic routing and 42 different routers and switches across a different, you know, you know, wide area network, if you will. So, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff is based on judgment. But every single time, it was really part of our package. Um, we do sell it as an outside for co-managed type things, where somebody is looking at unit cost of of management. Um, I think, kind of to, to Rob's point, you could also contract those as a non-item based and just some kind of per user cost uh, attribution. But um, certainly, you know we've got it in different flavors. Um, and, and I think, you know, to Adam's question directly, I think it's yours, you know, nobody has a silver bullet, right? I think, you know, find the way that makes sense to you. You may have one of those where this is a discussion point. You do have to sell it as an item cost. Um, it may be one of those where you are part of your reassessment of stack or part of an annual increase potentially for a client, but, uh, and, and maybe you just use it sparingly where it makes the most sense. But, but I think the point is, is that there are definitely use cases for a tool like this and its flexibility of how they charge and how they deploy makes it to where you can almost do it a, a lot of different ways. Um, right. So, um, yeah, to, Tara, to you. So. Yeah, I was going to say kind of on that point, um, I'm wondering if either of you use Avic in your initial assessments. So in the pre-sale side. So one of the things that I've talked to a lot of MSPs about is they say, you know what? got this new client, this is great, thought it was going to be, you know, a really vanilla network, not complex at all, all new stuff, no problem. I'm sure you've never heard that before, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they get it on the network, of course, different story, right? But yeah. oftentimes when people have deployed Avic post-sale, they find the surprises. So I'm asking both of you, do you guys use it on the discovery side of things so that there is no, no surprise after the paperwork signed, they throw it over the fence, and now you've got to catch... You know what you're catching, I guess, instead of just yep. mystery, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I use that. So, again, I believe in integration, right, and how everything's integrated together. It, key, Ovic is key for that. So I use a tool called LionGuard. Um, I go in with LionGuard. I start up an agent, and I have it collect data uh, depending, on what, depending on an interview I have with the customer based on what they're running. Um, I throw Ovic in the environment as well. Um, Ovic pulls in all of this data, but not only does it pull into the data, because of the integration, I'm able to also dump that data into this single pane of glass um, without having to use my PSA, of course, because I don't want to have to light up a new customer into PSA unnecessarily. Um, but all of that gets dumped into this wealth of information that I'm collecting that's well beyond, you know, Ovic's reach. 
but this is going to give me that full view before I dip my toe into the water and say, yes, I'll sign here and we'll, we'll take over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matt, anything to add on that note? I mean, we've used it in, in one of those moments where it's not as vanilla and we're trying to define it, right? Where we, we know there's some, some edges there. What, what we used to do, uh, and this is when I was involved in sales operations, they don't let me talk to those people anymore as much. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, we, we used to have a series of maybe four or five questions that if any of those answers were a specific way, we needed to do some deeper digging before validating that contract and its pricing, right? And that was when we had, you know, more dynamic pricing that wasn't just user and there's some other things involved. And so, we would come in with Avic whenever we had one of those situations where some of those questions had been violated, right? Like, are they using a layer three routing or things like that that might be involved? I don't remember the specific questions anymore, but you know, it, it helped us get in and say, okay, let's go see how many are there, how out of date are they, what what is it going to cost to my operations, right? You know, you find those silly things, and I, I keep thinking of them as they come up. But one was this uh, this this network problem from a wireless perspective that this nursing home had. And what we found out when we did a network map was every single AP was on another switch that was repeated from another switch up in the attic above the ceiling. And that's how they were doing this. And there were some like 11 switches deep by the time you got from the end extremities back to the center, right? And so it's just a no bueno. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, those were things we wouldn't have found unless we were visually getting on ladders and trying, you would just assume, oh, those APs go back to those bricks back there. No, those POEs are powering the next switch and somewhere up the line, they got power plugged in and they're powering the next switch through. P like it literally was crazy and you don't see it, you see it and then you're like, this is, this can't be right. And, right? and then you get up on a ladder and go, oh, this is what's happening. All right. Um, yeah, sorry to go back a little bit, but that was a regression that kind of came up in my head. So. No, that's awesome. And before we go to the next question, the only thing that I would say to our listeners today is this is definitely something that I, as a partner success manager at Avic, talk to our partners about all the time. So if you have any questions about, you know, where's the best value proposition? How do I manage, how do I manage my managed service packages? You know, what makes sense for me? Here's where I want to go. Like, that's what we're here to talk about. So we're here to help you kind of maximize that. And, and hopefully these two can attest to that, but that, yeah. that's what we do. <laughs> I actually want to steal this, this without a question yet on that point. Right. And somebody asked a question here and said, you know, how, what do you do for overload out of the box, best practices? You know, Terry, you and I have a meeting every yeah. month or every two weeks or something. And we, we meet and speak for an hour and strategize. And so what I want to speak to that, you know, directly is that use your resources at Avic for that, right? Any product. And I don't mean this, you know, just specifically with Avic, but the more you put into it, the more you get out of it, right? Yes, there's best practices. Yes, there are horror stories people have learned. Yes, there's probably resources you can talk to. Yes, you can probably even meet up if you want to do and have questions for one of us, right? So I think the point is, is that be involved in the community, you know, work with your person that, you, that you're working with and, and ask those questions. And they've been, you know, for me, it's been a long time. I mean, this has been longer than I can remember when we signed the first ink on this. But, you know, it's been always one of those where just the, the resources are there. Everybody can help you. You know, we had a big issue with switches for a long time with Unify switches that were blowing up. And, you know, Unify never solved it. Avic did. Right. And, and I think that was kind of the conversation is that was really painful for a little bit. And when you're crashing people's switches three times a day, it's never acceptable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, you know, engage, I think, is the point. And, and yes, I'll 100% second, you know, quadruple that, Tara, is that, you know, you're an invaluable resource for me uh, and, and being able to have that just back and forth about what's the next thing, what do we need to do. So. And, and on the note of best practices, I, I always say, you know, like I said, I'm old school, so I always start with requirements, right? What what are you trying to do with those alerts? You know, do you have any SLAs you need to hit? Do you have any, you know, a knock team that you have to integrate, you know? It, Let's let's figure out what those what your operations are and then what makes sense from an alerting perspective. So absolutely, partner success team is is here to help you with that. And I would just say absolutely just you know echoing what Matt said, reach out to us and, and say, okay, here's my challenge. Here's what I need to set up. I'm not quite sure how to do it, or this is too loud, or you know, let's modify something here because that's what we're here for. Yeah. And I'm not a talent, but I do talk with my hands a lot. I do too. And, and don't you know can shape your operation too with this. So when you are integrating a tool like this, yeah. don't forget to iterate with it, right? Don't don't try to see how you can jam it in current operations. Yeah. See how you can modify current operations. Like back to, to Rob's point, sales. There's a bunch of switches that are old. Let's replace them. I mean, yeah. You know, on that same topic, if you don't mind me stealing stealing again, you know, this this is something that that just recently happened. Um, I'm not a although I, I preach integration all the time, I'm not an API pro I'm not a programmer. 
I am old school. Give me a CLI and I'll type away and make anything. I can make a router dance. No problem. Um, but when it comes to writing scripts and, and trying to post and get, you know, from APIs, it's, it's not my thing. So I actually reached out to you and, and, and Tara, you, you, you showed me, you put me in contact with someone over in Ovic and I really want to get more information from Ovic than I was getting from the dashboard. I wanted to get a lot more data. And you, you, you provided me a resource in Ovic. He pointed me to a, a, a project that you're working on that is going to be absolutely free. It doesn't cost anything. And I can partake in it without any extra charge. And I can leverage it in any way I want and pull any data that Ovic currently collects and output it in any way I want. When he showed it to me, it was like eye-opening. I mean, it was an, an amazing um, partnership. That's, I really felt a level of partnership there, that you were there to help me with anything that I needed. Um, so that's something to look out for. I think it's going into beta. November 12th. There you go. Going into November 12th, going into beta. Um, yeah. But it's enough for us to to pull data in any format we want. And I think that is key. You're not going to find that with those big, those big firms out there that the big ones that everyone's using that you guys know the names of, you're not going to find that. You're not going to find that. You're not going to find a person that's going to take the time and walk you through these little things that you, that everyone else apparently knows, but I don't, I'm not a programmer and you guys helped me get the information I needed. So that's something I definitely wanted to throw on top of that too. I don't think that. Yeah. <laughs> Not and, and, and that's what I take back to our product teams, right? Is okay, you know, this tool this tool is used primarily by network engineers. Network engineers are not developers, right? So, you know, guys, what can we do to supplement this information? How can we make this easier? And this is where part of being that smaller company in a scale up organization is that we are building as we get the feedback, right? We are not some of those bigger guys that are like, yep, get in line, we'll we'll give you a number, right? right. This is where, okay, you know what? I'll put you in touch with the VP of product. And on that note, um, I know I've told some of you, but our, our next product product roadmap webinar is actually coming up next week on the 17th. So if you don't have information on that, reach out to your partner success managers as well, because this is where you have that opportunity to literally talk to our product head and ask questions about these things, right? Get in touch with him. Why this, not that? You know, does that mean this? Like, absolutely. That's what we're here for. Right. Very cool. Now, any closing notes? I think we just have a few more minutes here, but... Um, do you have a favorite success story that you want to share with everybody? Hmm. I can see Matt's deep in thought already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, when I uh, when I can bring a product that I am supporting to any customer that doesn't have insight into the things that I'm offering, is a successful in, is a successful interaction with a customer. And every single time I deploy an AUVIC, I end up with a customer that is seeing something that they never saw before, mm -hmm. you know, what, either with the map and they wonder, wait, why is there a link between there and there? And I get nervous and I wonder, wait, did AUVIC maybe pull the wrong thing? And then they go back to the closet and they're like, wait a second, this wire's here. It shouldn't be there, right? Every time that something like that happens, it's a success story for me. It, those are little instances, but it happens so often that it's, I'm having difficulty finding just one. So with that being said, this is a tool that you're not going to, you're not going to find very easily. It's the tool that covers all my bases. So um, every, every instance is a success story for me. Aw, nice. Yep. Now, and, and that's a great security find too, right? It you is. Know, it, it, oh yeah. I find access point, access points that are plugged into desks that happen to be a little Meraki access point that a customer, you know, one of the users, oh, I just wanted to have my little Wi-Fi here. Well, Ovic found it. And then when you see a Cisco environment and a D-Link device, you know, <laughs> you're, you immediately know there's a problem. <laughs> I barely have to dig when I see D-Link, there's a problem. So. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, a hundred percent. You know, I think that, what I always go back to is if I'm a network engineer, effective network engineering is context, right? It's understanding how things connect. It's understanding how things are meant to connect, what the best practices are compared to that. And I think one of the greatest things about Avic was 
for me, we actually had a um, an incident in our in our Dallas office, and it was a wireless um, attack, as it turned out. Um, and and we get into that maybe a lot deeper conversation. But initially, my first thing was to try to gain visualization, right? Was to try to figure out from a context somewhere I've never been, somewhere I'd never stepped into, and configs I'd never been around. Is is just what does it look like? What am I looking at from a network perspective? Where are my edges? What is, what am I going to have to deal with here? Where's the bottlenecks? And you know, that's the piece I think that I keep going back to is no matter how you use it, bill it, continue to use and expand Avic, it is probably the best tool at direct deep visualization in very few keystrokes, right? A few SMP strings, a few passwords on things, and you have a really large and beautiful map. And, and as you look at you know the roadmap, spoiler alert, potentially on, on where, where Avic's been going is that getting better out of the box deep information prior to SNMP gaining, prior potentially to some of those methodologies that actually show access. And um, what that's really cool for is showing you what access your adversaries can have as well on that same basis, right? So it does speak towards um, a lot of different aspects of security as well. Uh, you can't secure what you don't know. Uh, and if you've got a D-Link access point and you don't have systemic port blocking that's Mac-based or you know something that's tied into 802.11 that, that, can, that can tie into your, your enterprise credentials, right? Then, then you probably have a lot of exposure there, right? You probably have a lot of things that, that, that if I wanted to exploit them as a threat actor, it would be very easy to exploit for my benefit. And, and I think that's the point where, uh, and, and I just want to give this quick plug. I, I now know which Bob I'm talking to. Of, of course, he's right about what he's saying. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Bob. But yeah, absolutely. It's um, visualization, I think, is the piece I keep coming back to is we as humans, have varying degrees of ability to deep level understand something in a hierarchy that we can map and model and roll around in our head. This takes an engineer that can do the work in a linear fashion and gives them the ability to see things in a non-linear fashion across the entirety of the network. And I think that's one of the pieces that, you know, my brain works that way and that's how I think, but it's really nice to be able to say, no, let me just show you what I'm talking about right here, right? And so that's huge. Yeah, I hate seeing those maps that are a star and you had a router in the middle and you got like a 500 different things on the yeah. end. The, yeah. Those maps kill me. And then when you see Ovik and it's actually making sense, it's like, this is the way in and this is branches out. That, oh my God, that is huge. I love yeah. it. Well, and as a non-IT professional, it's just that visual story is, is, is critical, right? Because it's really easy to get lost in, you know, specifics around, you know, subnets, routed here, la la la, right? It's like, okay, just show me, literally, let me draw, let me draw a line through this. Okay, so all of these things are impacted. Okay, that's bad, got it, right? It, right. it really just helps kind of have that common language to show everybody this is what we're talking about and this is how severe this is. This is the operational risk we're looking at, right? All right. Mm -hmm. all right, very good. Yes. Well, on, on that note, I think we're, yep, Michelle's back now and I think she's gonna wrap us up. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, just we're almost out of time here. Um, Want to say a big thank you, um, Tara, Matt, Robinson. This has been a fantastic session. Um, you saw on the screen at the beginning how to connect with these lovely gentlemen um, on LinkedIn and they said they'd be more than happy to connect. Um, so okay. please do that.